he, he, he has what? 700 small boats in the lagoon. Um, oh, okay, cool. D don't, don't the Germans have, like, big, heavy guns? <laughs> yes, they do. So, so, so I guess the 700 small boats are hoping they're not spotted, huh? Okay, well, it, risky, very risky. Yeah, okay. June 25th, 1943. I cover the war week by week, right? Well, this week is week number 200. Before we start the show, here's a word from our sponsors. Smash the tyrants. Fight for democracy. Join the Time Ghost Army. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, hundreds of thousands of Soviet workers were busy building defense lines in the Kursk salient. The offensive they're building them to withstand has been postponed by Adolf Hitler until July. The Allies decided that their bombing campaign of Germany would focus on fighter plane factories, and they took a few Mediterranean islands between Tunisia and Sicily. They're aiming to take some South Pacific islands starting this week. Now, the big Solomon Islands offensive, Operation Cartwheel, is to really get going the 30th with Operation Toenails to take New Georgia. But the preliminaries start now on the 21st with landings on Sagi Point. They are unopposed and reinforced the next day. On the 23rd, they also make landings on Woodlark Island in the Trobriands across the Solomon Sea to the west. They then land on Carowina Island, the largest of the chain. I talked last week about the Allied offensive plans and goals, and I'd like to talk a bit about the Japanese situation now. The fight for Guadalcanal left them on the defensive in the South Pacific, but they really need to hold their positions in the region to protect the fleet base at Truk and the approaches to the Philippines. Rabaul is the key to that defense, so as much as the Allies want to take it, the Japanese want to keep it for their own. But the Imperial Japanese Army and Navy do not agree on how that is to be done. Imperial Headquarters says that the Central and Northern Solomons are both to be defended. But the Army just suffered the experience of having a big force sent to Guadalcanal and then not being adequately supplied and starving. So they want to defend at Bougainville in the north, thinking the Central Solomons will be just too difficult to supply. They do have some justification for this. The Navy, though, wants to hold New Georgia in the center so the defense at Bougainville will have some depth. So they agreed back in March that the Army would defend the north and the Navy the center. They did give some army units to the Navy then, but not nearly enough ground forces to hold the Central Solomons. So the 17th Army has sent the Southeastern Detachment to Kolombangara and New Georgia. This force, under Noboru Sasaki, is under command of the Navy's 8th Fleet, though. So how it will work in practice is the Army will run the defense of Munda and the Navy Enogai and Bairoko. We have seen this sort of inter-service rivalry in the Japanese command before, and it does very much sabotage combined operations. In other commands, there are changes being made. In the Kuban, last week on the 17th, Soviet 9th Army Commander Kozlov was replaced by Alexei Grechkin. His army has now assembled over 700 small boats, and his orders are to infiltrate the lagoon area with them and reach Temriuk. He sends two rifle divisions to help this operation, and by the 21st, they've reached the Verbianaya Kosa, the Verbianaya Spit, northeast of Temriuk. They plan to continue down the coast by night, but they have, in fact, been detected by the Germans. And when they move in, German flat guns tear the boats to pieces. Adolf Hitler still very much wants to keep the Kuban, but he no longer wants to keep Richard Ruoff in command of the 17th Army. On the 24th, he is replaced by Erwin Janneke, a Stalingrad survivor. But although Ruoff wasn't exactly energetic, he, he was limited in large part by circumstance. I mean, in April and May, 17th Army took 17,000 casualties. And with Operation Citadel looming, there weren't replacements available. So the whole situation since then has been an economy of force situation. Well, I imagine we shall see soon enough if a new face at the top brings any big changes. As for Operation Citadel, the big Axis offensive against the Kursk salient, it has been set for July 3rd. 
I've talked about the opposing plans for this the past couple of weeks, but mostly about the ground forces to be involved. But the VVS, the Red Air Forces, are planning to give the Soviets more air support than they've had before. Just Nikolai Vatutin's Voronezh front will be backed by over 1,400 planes from the 2nd and 17th VA. The primary mission of the VVS was to deny the Luftwaffe control of the air over the battlefield. And these two air armies have a 2.5 to 1 numerical superiority in fighters over Flieger Corps 8. In addition, the VVS deployed over 500 IL-2 Sturmoviks to provide close air support sorties to Vatutin's ground troops. The Germans have never faced this level of threat from Soviet aviation before. The 16th VA will support Konstantin Rokossovsky's Central Front further north with some 950 combat planes, a 2 to 1 superiority over Walter Model's opposing forces. An interesting side note, flying with the 16th is the Free French Normandy Escadrille, who have been operational in the USSR since March, flying Yak-1 fighters. As for under the ground, I mentioned last week the 134,000 landmines on one of Vatutin's expected fronts, yeah? Well, that is just part of the 934,000 mines in total around the salient. That's nearly a million landmines. That will likely be a serious obstacle. Heck, in just Soviet 13th Army sector, they have laid 2,600 mines per kilometer. There were no gaps or places to bypass the minefields unlike in the past. The new Red Army Mine Warfare Doctrine issued in April 1943 stressed depth in minefields. Several layers of minefields, each up to 100 meters in depth. Soviet sappers mixed in wooden PMD-6 anti-personnel mines with the anti-tank mines, which were difficult to detect with electronic minesweepers. The new Soviet Mine Warfare Doctrine also emphasized the importance of motorized mobile obstacle detachments whose role was to lay mines in front of advancing enemy units. These truck mounting companies, or platoons, can lay a minefield in just a few hours. So, that's set for the 3rd. And July 10th is the kickoff date for Operation Husky, the huge Allied invasion of Sicily. So, big offensives are soon to be launched in three very different parts of the world. Husky will be interesting in its composition. I mean, they're launching an amphibious invasion, but the troops also need training in mountain warfare, and they'll have to bring in things like donkeys and mules. There will be, as I said two weeks ago, the issue of troop supply over the beaches to tackle, since Palermo is not an objective. And as I said even more weeks ago, the Allies will be using the DUKW duck amphibious vehicle to solve that issue. These have never been really used before, and they're going to have to be in service 24 hours a day. There are to be 350 of them in use on D-Day of Operation Husky. In terms of rehearsals for combined operations, the British have been training in the Middle Eastern desert. These exercises are often on land, but are supposed to simulate landings from boats. A large exercise finishes the 19th when three brigades from two divisions of 13th Corps, over 23,000 total troops, and 344 vehicles return to Suez. Their exercise has been troop, vehicle, and supply landings at beaches nearby. Another big one supposed to happen this week is for the 1st Canadian Infantry Division on a section of the Ayrshire coast of Scotland that physically resembles the Pequino Peninsula in Sicily. This is cancelled just as it starts because of high winds at sea. 15th Army Group Commander Harold Alexander is racing against time with this sort of thing and the problems that arise when training formations so far apart and with issues as to the availability of actual instructors and equipment. But a lot of troops and commanders have already learned a bunch from Operations Torch and Corkscrew. Torch, the invasion of Northwest Africa last November, involved over 100,000 troops and 850 boats in a three-pronged assault. Although virtually unopposed, the Torch landings had highlighted a lack of specialized assault equipment as well as a dysfunctional beach group maintenance system, exacerbated by cohorts of poorly trained officers and men. Corkscrew, of course, was the invasion of Pantelleria and the local Mediterranean islands two weeks ago. The British 1st Infantry, who made the landings, did not meet resistance, but they got the opportunity to conduct an amphibious assault and live fire exercise. On the 13th, 
Colonel A.J. Head wrote 15 performance observations about this. He had been personally assigned there from Combined Operations HQ in London, and while there was much he thought went well, he thought the LCAs, landing craft assaults, which carry 35 men to the beaches, spent way too long forming up by the LCIs, landing craft infantry transports, before moving in, leaving them very vulnerable to any aerial attack or coastal defenses. There was a failure of communication between beach groups, which caused confusion and delays, and since Husky is going to initially take place when it's still dark, signals and communications issues are going to be worse there and play a more significant role. He also noted lax security at the ports of embarkation, meaning that locals or spies could fairly easily have judged the sailing date of Corkscrew and by extension Husky, which could wreck any surprise which is of paramount importance to the assault forces. Since Torch, to improve beach maintenance, they've organized beach bricks. Problem with these is how to really staff them since no one wants to lock men into a specialized unit that's only gonna do one temporary operation. And overall, Commander Dwight Eisenhower wants them to be able to also be first assault reinforcements. The solution is beach groups built around entire infantry battalions who will revert to their main duties once beach work is finished. Several beach groups will be under one main beach headquarters so they can set up supply depots with coordination and continuity of command on the beaches. Beach groups will arrange and control all personnel and vehicle transport from landing craft to inland assembly points. They'll move supplies to the beach maintenance areas. They'll develop the beaches for defense, administration, and casualty evacuations, and they will run signals. After having done recon for 94 beaches on Sicily, they'll arrive at two main ones, each some 80 kilometers long. But choosing landing beaches has been no easy task. What is the gradient of the approach to land? Are there underwater rocks? Is it a sand or stony beach? James Garvey writes a bunch about the beach issues and the recon in Operation Husky, and it's pretty interesting. A big feature of Sicilian beaches is sandbars and false beaches 25 to 50 meters offshore. And what does that mean for landing craft? Will they need pontoons because the craft can't make it to shore? And how about the exit from the beach to the actual mainland? Another regular feature of Sicilian beaches is that many exits are blocked by cliffs. Well, back at the Casablanca conference in January, the North African Photographic Reconnaissance Wing was created, and they've been surveying the ports, beaches, and beach defenses. Starting May 16th and continuing even the next couple weeks from now, they'll fly 1,086 recon sorties. But in addition to aerial recon, beach recon parties were active from February. Small joint teams of Royal Navy and Royal Engineers have been launched by night from submarines in either collapsible canoes or chariot manned torpedoes. These guys measure water depth, distance to shore, and they take core samples from every beach. If this sounds like dangerous work on enemy territory, that's because it is. By just the end of March, over a third of the men were lost. But all of this work has created very accurate models and maps of the beaches. And even though the men who are to attack Sicily will not know their actual destination until they're at sea, about to reach Sicily, they will be familiar with the beaches they are to assault well in advance. There are many other Allied assaults happening this week, though, from the skies. On June 20th, Operation Bellicose begins. This is the first shuttle bombing raid of the war, meaning the bombers leave Britain and hit Friedrichshafen and then fly on to Algerian air bases. On the return leg, they'll hit the Italian naval base at La Spezia. The German attack is on the Würzburg radar factory, but in addition to damaging that, it also destroys a V-2 rocket production line there, but the Allies do not even know that it was there. On the 21st and 22nd, bombing raids again on Wuppertal cause another firestorm and 5,000 deaths and stop production. The famous German raid on Coventry killed 380 and stopped production for a month. Even the British protest when London newspapers compare photographs of the two bombed cities. On the 25th, 300 tons of bombs are dropped on Messina. And this week, British Prime Minister Winston Churchill says that air supplies to Josip Tito in Yugoslavia must have priority even over the bombing of Germany. 
On the 23rd, he tells the British Chiefs of Staff that 500 tons a month of arms and supplies is a small price to pay for the diversion of German and Italian units to Yugoslavia, and that it is vital to keep it going. One person who seems to be worried about that diversion is Italian leader Benito Mussolini, who speaks in Rome to the fascist party directorate about the threat of invasion on the 24th. And with that, I will end the week. A week of small Allied gains in the Solomons, small Allied failure in the Kuban, training and training in the Middle East, massive mine laying in the USSR, and bombing, bombing, and more bombing. Oh, and on the 22nd, the French Committee of National Liberation decides that Henri Giraud will keep command of French forces in North Africa and Charles de Gaulle elsewhere. 200 weeks of the war so far, close on to four years, and not that much shorter now than the whole Great War lasted, and both sides are gearing up for huge offensives soon to be launched. There is no end in sight. No side is close to being defeated, and it's pretty obvious that this war will end up being, by almost any measure, greater than the Great War. Madness. 200 weeks of the war coverage financed by the Time Ghost Army. It is true. Fortunately for us, it's growing so we can make more of this content. These are the newest Time Ghost officers, and Nathan Black is the Time Ghost Army Member of the Week. Join the army at timeghost.tv or patreon.com so we can keep this coming week after week after week. We even cover the war day by day on Instagram, which you can also find on the community tab here. And hey, both Sparty and myself have set our personal Instagram accounts to public fairly recently, and we post personal stuff there. Do we not, Sparty? We do indeed. We do indeed. His is more sartorial, and mine is just funny and weird. You're all welcome to check all of that out as well. God, I almost did it. Almost did it with no mistakes. Anyhow, do not forget to subscribe, and I'll see you next time.